Hi, and welcome back to Small Caps. My name is Jess Holland. Today, we are catching up with Chimeric Therapeutics. The ticker code is CHM. The company just put out positive results for their preliminary phase one recurrent brain cancer clinical trial. And here to tell us more about this very exciting news is the managing director and CEO, Jennifer Chow. Hi, Jennifer. It's lovely to have you on the show. Hi, Jess. It is wonderful to be here today. We're very excited. Fantastic. So, so Jen, just to get straight into it, you released new clinical data um, this week for CHM1101. For those who aren't familiar with this, um, can you start by giving us a little bit of uh, a background on this asset? Yes, I'd love to. So CHM1101 or 1101 is also known as chlortoxin car -T. And so the chlortoxin CAR-T is actually the asset upon which Chimeric was founded. We licensed this asset from City of Hope back in 2020 and then entered clinical trials with it. It is what we refer to as a first-in-class asset, which means that we are the very first company developing this type of asset, which is always very important when you think about ultimately being able to approve and sell the drug. And this is what we refer to as an autologous or personalized cell therapy. So that means that with this type of asset, we're actually taking a patient's own blood cells. We are engineering those cells in a laboratory, and then we're actually sending those engineered cells back to the patient for infusion. So, you know, that's just a little bit of background on, on the asset itself. We believe that the asset is uh, incredible and has great promise for the future and certainly are very excited about, about where we're seeing, what we're seeing today and where we're headed. That is so fascinating, Jen. Now, can you provide some more details about the, the methodology and the patient selection criteria for the phase one clinical trial? Um, yeah, just, just for our audience. Yeah. So for those of you that don't spend all day in drug development, a phase 1A clinical trial, which is what this is, is what we also refer to as a first in human clinical trial. And so what we do with these clinical trials is we actually dose escalate. And so what that means is we start the clinical trial at a very low dose so that we can actually make sure that the drug is safe for patients. And that really is the primary objective of these trials to establish safety in patients. And then slowly over time, what we do is we start to dose escalate. So this particular trial looked at four different dose levels and every, you know, we did three patients in each dose level, and then we went up to a higher dose level. And all the while we were looking to see what the safety was and make sure that the drug was safe for patients. So that really was the objective of the trial. We obviously also look for efficacy in the patients as we're establishing the safety, but that's really the difference with first in human phase. 1A trials. And with this particular trial, in terms of the eligibility for the trial, patients had to be uh, have recurrent glioblastoma. So essentially what that means is that a patient would come in, be diagnosed with glioblastoma, they would receive a first-line therapy, and then as they go on to progress, they would become eligible for this clinical trial. Hmm, that's so interesting, Jen. Now, for our audience, what do you think are the most important things to know about the data that you that you found? Um, and specifically, can you explain the efficacy results in a little bit more detail? Yeah, I would love to. I would love to spend all day talking about the efficacy results as well as the overall results of the trial. So, you know, first and foremost, there are really three things that we look for. And as I just mentioned, the primary one being establishing safety. And then we look for what is called disease response. And really that is just, just as it sounds, we're looking to see whether or not a patient responds to the therapy at all. And then the third thing that we look for, and this is really the most important thing, is whether or not the therapy is actually making a patient live longer. So with our clinical trial, we were able to establish safety. And so generally what we saw is that all patients that were enrolled in this trial across all four DOS levels were able to tolerate the therapy quite well. And so there were no what we call dose limiting toxicities. There was no CRS, which is something that is often attributed to CAR T cell therapies. And there was no tumor lysis syndrome. So overall, we were very pleased with the safety we established. 
In terms of the response rate, what we saw was that 55% of the patients that were treated achieved a disease control or disease stability. And that really is phenomenal when you look at the historical controls of about 20 to, you know, 35%. So certainly we were very, very excited about what we were seeing with this disease control rate. And then most importantly, we were able to show survival. And so generally as patients enter that, you know, recurrence and they move into a second line therapy in glioblastoma, you expect their survival to be about seven months. As they head into third or fourth line, obviously that expectation comes down. And our patients were actually fourth line um, the patients for the most part. So we were very pleased when we were able to see 9.9 .9 months of survival for those that achieved disease control. And even more exciting was that we were able to see one patient who we know actually survived about 19 months. And there's a second patient that is now at about 14.4 months. That patient is actually alive and remains in follow-up. So very excited what we're seeing with the survival as well. Wow, Jen, that's really, really impressive and so many things that I want to unpack over there. But first, um, you mentioned that the patients were sort of heavily pretreated or late stage. Can you give our small caps audience sort of an idea of what does that mean and, and why is that important? Yeah, it's really um, important when you think about trying to be able to set down what you would expect to see in these patients. Right. And so, you know, we always want to be able to assess the data that we have against historical analogs, other clinical trials, what you would expect, how you would expect these patients to do. And so that that's why it's, you know, really important for us to understand this. What what you really see is that normally in glioblastoma trials, patients are treated in what we refer to as second line. So just as I said, their disease recurs, then they get at a second therapy. That's second line. If the disease recurs again, then they go on to a third therapy, third line, and so on and so on. And generally, all of the clinical trials that we've seen and the, the other assets that are approved in this space have treated patients in second line. Our patients, we have know we now know, were actually patients that for the majority of them were treated in fourth or fifth line. So these are patients that had gone through first, second, third, and sometimes fourth line therapies before they actually came onto the clinical trial. And this is really important to understand because what you would expect is that the survival of these patients as they enter the later lines is diminished. And so to be able to see the survival that we did see in these patients that were fourth and fifth line patients really make the results all that more meaningful for us. Yeah, that's so interesting, Jen. And, and just sticking with the topic of the survival um, outcomes that you that you managed to achieve so far, um, you know, with one of the patients exceeding 18 months, that's quite remarkable. Uh, what, what insights can you share with us about the potential sort of reasons behind the extended survival rates um, in, in heavily pretreated patients? Yeah, you know what, I think that is just one of the million dollar questions, right, is is particularly as you develop cancer drugs, what we always want to be able to understand is why someone responds and somebody else doesn't and why somebody actually derives more benefit from a therapy. That's something that we're still really trying to understand and it really will take us some time and additional patience to understand that probably in more detail. But I think what we do know is that CHM1101, this chlorotoxin CAR-T, really in the preclinical stage, before we even started to work in patients, showed promising efficacy. So we do know that the, the drug and the therapy itself has very potent activity. And so we really are seeing that in that patient with it had the 18-month survival. What we want to be able to do is understand a little bit more about why that patient responded so that we can actually see that type of response in more patients now. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jen. And and you mentioned also previously in one of your, your answers was that there was a 55% disease control rate, um, which is quite impressive. What factors do you attribute to the success of that in comparison to historical you know, disease control rates for similar patients? Yeah, I think it goes back again 
very similar to the survival to actually the potency of the, the therapy itself, right? And how the therapy itself is actually able to attack the glioblastoma cells. So one of the things that's a little bit different with the way that we give this therapy is we actually directly inject this therapy through catheters into a patient's brain cavity. And then we believe that potentially that actually may have an advantage as the drug is automatically going into that important brain cavity area where the cancer is. So I think that, you know, the actual design of the therapy and the construct alongside with the way it's administered potentially is what is letting us see some of the, these, these outcomes from an efficacy perspective that really have exceeded our expectations. Yeah, that's really interesting, Jen. And, and now... I know that you've touched on, you know, the safety profile of the drug in the context of this trial, um, especially given, you know, these, these patients were heavily pretreated. But were there any sort of unexpected adverse events or concerns with safety during the trial that you had? Yeah, I'm very pleased just to say that no, there was nothing unexpected or no concerns, you know, and I think to your point, it, it's important to note that particularly in a patient group that's so heavily pretreated, because generally, these patients are much more difficult from an adverse event perspective. But in the trial, we didn't see anything in terms of dose limiting toxicities, no CRS or tumor lysis. We saw a couple grade three adverse events, most notably cerebral edema, but those were really attributed to patient disease progression rather than to the drug. So, you know, we're very comfortable that we have a drug right now that has a manageable safety profile that we can continue to develop in clinical trials. Now, talking about development, um, you know, what are the next steps for development of this drug therapy? And, and what are the goals um, in terms of like the expansion cohorts uh, in the phase, uh, you know, 1B clinical trial itself? Yeah, this is the exciting part, right, as we continue to advance clinical development. So essentially, you move from a 1A trial when you're really looking to find the right dose and establish safety into a 1B trial. We opened a 1B trial earlier this year, and really what we wanted to be able to do was have the framework laid in the event that this data was positive so that we could really start to advance development more quickly. That 1B clinical trial has started off and it's enrolling patients in Texas, and it actually started off as what we call a dose confirmation cohort. So what that means is that we've sat, essentially taken the highest dose level that was studied in the initial 1A trial, and we have started to look at just treating a couple patients at that dose to take a look that the dose is the right dose. What we had said is that, you know, we were going to wait to see what this data looked like before we committed to whether or not we were going to advance development through to the expansion cohorts. So we were very excited when we saw the data and really felt that it absolutely warrants us moving forward with it into those expansion cohorts. What the expansion cohorts do, and generally they we treat between 12 and sort of 30 patients, is they allow us to say, okay, we found the right dose of the drug. Now we actually want to really show the efficacy signal in a broader group or in a larger group of patients. And that allows us to then go to the regulatory authorities and say, look, we've been able to show that this group now of 30 patients or you know 20 or 30 patients has this level of efficacy. We want to move this into a registration trial. And that is really the registration trial is really what allows us to commercialize the drug and then be able to get it out to more patients. Yeah, Jen, so you mentioned sort of the regulatory side and also commercialization of the drug. I know this is probably a little bit preemptive, but but what comes next for, you know, CHM1101 and Chimeric as a whole? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I think with CHM1101, really, we want to be able to move this into the 1B expansion cohort, treat that number of patients that is then required by the regulatory agencies so that we can move into a registration trial. Our goal is always about making sure that we're looking for the most simple path to get from where we are to the patients that need the therapy. And so certainly that is really what we're going to be focused on now with CHM 1101. 
For Chimeric more broadly, obviously this is great news, but we actually have four ongoing clinical trials at the moment with uh, all of our assets. So we are continuing to develop our assets and really continuing to move all of the assets forward now in clinical trials and, and really see an action pack sort of next 12 to 18 months with a lot of clinical trial activity. Oh, Jane, well, it's just, um, it must feel so good to work for a company who's doing, you know, these things that can help humanity um, in the future. So I just have one final question for you, Jane, and that is, can you give us two or three sort of, you know, key points to summarize, you know, why you believe that CHM is potentially a good investment um, for our audience? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And thank you for asking it, Jess. You know, I, I think that there's probably three, in my mind, three key things right now. I think that Chimeric has an incredibly innovative portfolio, but it's highly undervalued if you actually look at our share price and our market cap right now. You know, as I said, we now have four clinical trials ongoing, and we have two assets that have actually shown positive phase one data. And you, when you compare that to companies that still are in preclinical, I believe that our assets and our innovation and development really make us undervalued. I think the second piece is really about where we are with our development, which is really important in today's market. You know, when you think about value realization for investors, ultimately we want to be able to look at realization through either a sale of the asset or the company or out licensing. What we know in today's market is that pharmaceutical companies have raised their bar. So before, when they would sit down and have conversations, potentially look at doing deals or M&A, they may be looking, willing to look at preclinical data. Now, you can't even get in the room with preclinical data. You absolutely need to be able to come and show them clinical data. And so I think the second part is really about the fact that we have clinical development right now. And we're really at this place moving into 1B trials where we have the opportunity to start to engage for real value realization. And then I think the third thing is that, you know, I think everybody has been challenged and we are all keenly aware of how difficult this market has been. And, and, you know, I think we take that very seriously. We've really been doing our best to navigate all of the challenges that this particular market bring us. We've worked very hard to prioritize our programs to be able to advance and spend our cash against our clinical programs. We have been very diligent in our cash preservation. We don't have office facilities. We've cut back our team. And so we've taken all that very seriously. And we've been able to actually make the most of our business development activities. So two of our clinical trials are currently as done as collaborations where we actually put out very minimal cash to be able to do those clinical trials. So we get the clinical advancement without the financial outlay. And then on the other side, you know, we certainly have been able to bring in non-dilutive sources of funding through business development. So probably a bit longer than the answer, Jess, but, uh, you know, I think those three things are really important and, and I think really give opportunity and value for investors today. Yeah, Jen, I think that's a really, really key point, especially in this market. And I think for, you know, every sector at the moment, uh, capital markets are challenging and, and to have the clinical advancement, you know, without that uh, financial overlay is um, is really important at this stage and particularly when you're undergoing clinical trials. So yeah, that's great. But Jen, um, thank you so much for joining us again today. Um, it's always great to hear from you and to learn more about the company's, you know, groundbreaking developments in this sector. So thank you. Thank you so much just for taking the time. It was great to see you again.